uh, today I'm going to talk about digital twin for quality innovations. Uh, this is joint work with my PhD student, uh, Han Kang Lee, and uh, my former PhD students, uh, Alex and uh, Bing. And uh, it was uh, wonderful to work with a uh, fantastic uh, uh, PhD student. Slide. So first, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, ISE, uh, data analytics and information systems, as well as quality control and reliability engineering for uh, inviting me and uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, uh, showcase my uh, recent research studies on digital twin. And a special thanks to Dr. Chelsea and uh, Xiaowei and uh, Saeed and uh, the organizing committee uh, for um, all the efforts and time you put into these events. And uh, I just talked about my former PhD student. I want to also acknowledge and the first one is Han Kang Lee. And uh, yeah, that's uh, just a, a photo from Informs. And the middle one is Alex. And uh, he has graduated. Now is an assistant professor at uh, Penn State. And Dr. Bing Yao, uh, an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee, uh, Knoxville. And also this is a wonderful group of my uh, present uh, current PhD student and a former PhD student. So this is an outline of today's talk. First, I will talk a little bit about advanced sensing and uh, the history of industrial engineering and how advanced sensing uh, really provides a great opportunity for us to build the cyber physical digital twin. And then I will talk about uh, human digital twin, product digital twin, process digital twin, and then digital threat. And after that, I will talk about uh, three uh, topics. The first one is uh, virtual sensor, or we call it sensor digital twin for quality monitoring or statistic process monitoring. This is a work with uh, Alex and uh, my colleague Dan Fink. And uh, then I will talk about factory digital twin for operations management and uh, with my PhD student, uh, Han Kang Lee. And by the way, Han Kang is in the job market right now. And uh, if you are interested in digital twin and uh, his work, please and uh, give him an opportunity. And uh, he's a, a wonderful uh, PhD student and a very talented uh, researcher too. And the last one is uh, a heart digital twin for smart health. And this is a joint work with my PhD, uh, former PhD student, uh, Dr. Bing Yao, and uh, on sensing modeling and optimization of cardiac system. So first, let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, industrial engineering and also about Penn State. So Penn State IE is the uh, nation's first academic department and uh, uh, BS curriculum in industrial engineering and established uh, in 1909 and uh, housed in the uh, main engineering. And as you can see here, our founding department head, Hugo uh, Daimer, was a national uh, recognized uh, advocate of uh, managerial training for engineers. And uh, there's another name here, uh, a well-known scientist, uh, Frederick uh, Tyler, father of uh, scientific management. So this is a plate that I see in the campus and then I took a picture I wanna show, uh, show you guys. And at the, same at the same time, I want to talk a little bit more about Frederick Tyler. And Frederick Tyler has a well-known book called The Principles of Scientific Management. And uh, this book pretty much uh, 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 marks the debut of industrial engineering. And uh, in this book, we emphasize, uh, Frederick emphasized scientific management. Scientific is based on the work measurement. So a lot of timing studies measure the human operators, measure the products, and measure the process. And uh, are the sensors and how we do the measurement are different 100 years ago and, uh, for, uh, and nowadays. And so at the current moment, we have extraordinary capability to do the sensing. So my lab, here's the introduction of my lab, complex systems lab, focus on uh, manufacturing and uh, healthcare applications and uh, uh, manufacturing machines and the uh, human heart. And the human heart is also a biomechanical machine and uh, pumping the blood and also has electric uh, activities. So monitoring uses uh, wireless sensor networks and uh, supervisory control and data acquisition systems to really solve the sensors and our internet of things. We, uh, we actually connect data in many seconds in real time. So, the extraordinary capability to, to do the sensing and give us uh, uh, opportunity, unprecedented opportunity to do the monitoring and the modeling and uh, uh, analysis. 
including system informatics, process control, and decision-making quality engineering. So specifically why I have quality innovations today, because uh, focus on the quality and the reliability uh, improvement. Uh, definitely the sensor also uh, provides data for computer modeling, experiments, and simulation optimization. So the theoretical foundation of my lab is nonlinear dynamics, statistics, signal processing, simulation, optimization, and control theory. And I have a hybrid background in electric engineering, automation, and uh, industry and systems engineering. So we just talked about the advanced sensing, and let's look at a few examples of advanced sensing. So in multi-stage assembly line, we have a programmable logic controller, and uh, we can pull the data from the sensors, and uh, we get to know the process when we are assembling the car. And uh, this is uh, ultra precision machining. When I was a PhD student in the midnight, every 12 uh, a.m. In the, in the midnight, I went to the lab and uh, I cut a lot of pieces. And uh, then we put the sensors like acoustic emission sensors, vibration sensors, and cutting force sensors so that we can uh, learn from those sensor signals and, uh, and uh, the, the surface finish and also how to control the quality of the surface finish of ultra precision machining. And uh, recently, additive manufacturing and attracts a, a, a lot of attention. So here is a, a multi-sensor platform uh, at Penn State, SIM3D. And uh, so we have multi-spectrum sensors, high-speed video, laser, and a layer-wise imaging and acoustic sensors. And uh, so this one is uh, very interesting because this one, we uh, this is a work that I did during my sabbatical leave last year. I was in uh, Finland, VTT lab, manufacturing lab. And we have this, this idea and to integrate uh, the scanner sensors, because you see the document scanner, you have document printer and scanner in one, but uh, we don't really have the printer and scanner in one for 3D printing, especially metal 3D printing in the market right now. Now we take the sensors that are used in the document scanner, like this line uh, contact imaging sensor, we integrate it with the recorder blade. So every time when you finish a layer, and we also scan a layer, and so that we can know how good the finish is for this layer. And if you are interested in this sensing capability, you can uh, review this paper, multi-resolution quality inspection of layer-wise fields for metal 3D printer and scanners. So in addition to uh, manufacturing the sensing, and there are also a few examples of the uh, uh, sensing in healthcare. So one of them is uh, uh, electrocardiogram signals that we put sensors on the body surface so we can get the uh, electric activities of the heart. And uh, this sensor data help us build the simulation model of the heart. And then we can build the digital twin of the heart. So every time when we have surgical plans and uh, we can test those in the virtual heart and uh, then we validate and optimize the treatment plans. And uh, uh, I also, my, my group also work with uh, a College of uh, Medicine uh, on the pharmaceutical design. So how uh, to study the ion flow through the uh, like calcium, sodium, and uh, calcium, uh, sodium, and the potassium, how they flow through the ion channels. And if there are too much sugar attached to the ion channels, how does it impact the ion channel activity? Then what kind of drug can we design to counterbalance the disease or genetic uh, uh, effects to the ion channels? And uh, specifically for the uh, uh, glycosylation, that is sugar, uh, attached to the ion channels. So it's a diabetic complication to the heart. And uh, so sensor, and obviously so far we see a lot of sensing in different areas. And uh, I know uh, many of the audience, you work also in the sensor uh, area, there are many different kinds of sensors. And the sensors that un provides unprecedented access to data, not just the offline manner, but also in the online manner. So the physical world, and it uh, can be really mapped into the cyber world because of the data access. And I want to highlight, this is a manufacturing shop in Qinghua. So Xiaowei, this is, <laughs> this is from you, you maybe the, the basement of Qinghua manufacturing uh, shop. And then when I visited Qinghua, I took a picture. And uh, then you can build the uh, manufacturing shop in the cyber world. And, but that's not, uh, that's just for visualization, right? But mostly, more importantly, we want to uh, develop insights and actions so we can feed back to the physical world. So there are two papers related to the cyber physical digital twin. And uh, so this is one paper with my colleagues and uh, Dr. Kumara and uh, my advisor, Dr. Bukapatanam and uh, Dr. Uh, Fuji Zong and uh, on Internet of Things for Smart Manufacturing. 
and uh, with my student Han Kang on the digital twin and the optimization of manufacturing process flows. So here, when we build the digital twin, we are not just focusing on one machine. We're focusing on a network of machines in this uh, in this paper. So it's all on the system and the process and um, of, of a network of machines. So we talked about the insights, actions. So let me give you an example of what kind of insights and actions can we develop from the digital team. And uh, we just come back from Infos. And uh, when we arrive at the airport, many of the, uh, for many times, many of the times, we pull the phone out and we order Uber, right? When you look at your Uber, you see the digital cars and they're running on the street. And, uh, and we have access to the, the Uber and the, the, the app has access to the GPS data. So you know where they are and uh, you can order um, from the phone. And uh, so there are physical cars on the street. There are also virtual cars or digital cars in the cyber world. And the algorithms and the scheduling algorithms, control algorithms, they are running in the cyber world so that you can get the car you want in a timely manner. So that's an example of uh, what a digital thing should really uh, uh, look like in the in, in the future and if you uh, see this example how does it connect to the uh, manufacturing digital team and the healthcare digital team and also the digital team maybe you have in your mind and uh, how to develop such insights and action that's more important than just the uh, synchronized data so we talked a little bit about digital team the overview now let's dive into the definition of digital team and uh, let's show a few cases about different type of digital team so the digital thing now is a buzzword. And uh, what we want to do is to unwrap the buzzword. And the, the, the definition of ISO is manufacturing. Um, fit for purpose digital representation of observable manufacturing element with synchronization between the element and its digital representation. That's ISO's definition in the manufacturing uh, field and what a digital thing is. But I think this is not uh, very comprehensive yet because it uh, miss it misses the insights and the action in the in this definition. So UK National Digital Twin Germany uh, Principles Report add a little bit more into this definition. That is what distinguishes a digital twin from any other digital model is its connection to the physical twin. So that's a connection part or synchronization part. But based on the data from the physical assets or systems, a digital twin unlocks value principally by supporting improved decision-making which creates the opportunity for positive feedback into the physical uh, twin. That's three levels. And uh, in the very early stage, we develop a simulation model. Simulation is a, basically a, a fundamental tool in IE, right, in system engineering. We develop simulation models and uh, the digital models. We have physical objects and also there are digi uh, digital objects that we create in the simulation model. But the data are loosely uh, uh, connected or in, a, uh, uh, in an offline manner and uh, we use those data to calibrate the model. And that's a manual data flow. But now you see if you, uh, the second phase is we use the sensors to build the digital shadow. Now you can synchronize the data and do the visualization of the data you connected uh, from the physical object. But more importantly, we need to close the loop and uh, have the information and the insights and action back just as we discussed in the Uber example, right? So now let's look at a few digital twins, the first human digital twin. And uh, I found this buy one, get one free picture from walmart.com. And uh, that's a twin. And when we, when we say twin, that's an example of a twin and a human digital twin. But uh, let's look at uh, how like a movie industry or computer graphics, they develop a digital twin, human digital twin. And uh, this is a movie called The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. So. Brad Peter and uh, born old and not born as a kid, born old and then grow down to the kid and then die. Not born as a kid and uh, grow up, but grow down, right? And uh, in, so we need to, uh, the, the computer graphics actually take take the hands on uh, Brad Peter and, uh, and then build the human digital thing from pretty much the old time to a kid and for all the, uh, Brad Peter at a different uh, age times. You see the computer captures a face and then create a digital twin for Brad Peter. And uh, then Brad Peter is, is smiling. And then you can create different actions. That's a way to uh, create human digital team, the computer graphics. And uh, this technique currently is widely used in uh, virtual reality and also in the uh, Hollywood movie industry. 
And uh, if you see Bruce Lee is also now brought back to life and uh, by in the digital world, and uh, they and they create a digital twin of Bruce Lee too. And here we have the handsome Brad Peter and uh, create a digital twin for different ages of Brad Peter. And uh, here is an example of product digital twin. You see, uh, many years ago, like 50 years ago, we have this type of uh, like a heavy industry, right? And now we have digital twin. And uh, the, in the aviation industry, we have virtual asset and the physical asset. And uh, the product, we can do the design of the product in the virtual world, and then do the wind tunnel test and load test, all kinds of tests. And uh, so you can optimize your design. This is now widely deployed in the, in the aviation industry. And uh, during the production, you have all the process parameters and the production records. They are all attached to the digital twin and our sensor process monitoring data. And uh, during the operation phase, right? And then you also have the flight records and operational data. So in flight management, and after you, you actually take the flight to, to, to different places. So how do you leverage those data and connect the physical and the digital, uh, physical and, uh, and uh, virtual assets? And then create new insights and uh, actions and help the decision making, the operation uh, management and product design and the quality control in the production phase. So there are all kinds of objective and the industry engineers can tap into. And here is a process digital team. So that one is product. You, you actually have a product and then you put it in the, in the digital world. Now you have the process. So this is an uh, uh, interesting work with my colleagues, um, the Dr. Faisal Eklund and the Dr. Richard Job. And uh, we actually built a virtual factory in the, in the uh, factory in the virtual world, in the VR, uh, virtual reality. And assembly can be done in the virtual world. And uh, you see the PSU logo over there. So this is a car assembly line. And uh, that's the uh, chassis, uh, chassis. And uh, yeah, now you can, yeah, you create a, uh, PSU car and uh, the student just uh, use the paint and to paint the PSU over there. And uh, so, you know, this is a, a video created in, the, uh, in our group with, uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Eklund and Dr. Zhao. And Dr. Zhao is from uh, University of Calgary, Computer Science. And Dr. Eklund now is in the University of uh, Louisville and uh, he was in Penn State and uh, we work together on this project. And even now we are working together. And also the, uh, my P former PhD student, Dr. Uh, Haidon Kim, and uh, Reju. Reju now is an assistant professor at OU, University of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and Haidong is in Philadelphia Children's Hospital. And uh, so, so far we talk about the process. Process is different stages, and uh, you actually track the production records and uh, the process monitoring data, and then you build the process digital twin. Now it comes to the digital thread. And uh, from the cradle to uh, the grave, product life cycle, you have product design, and then based on the design, you can do the simulation and design test and the materials, then you get the materials and the, from the mining and, uh, and, uh, and different suppliers, you get the supply. And then we can do the production manufacturing. And the, during the manufacturing, we have factory operations and maintenance. After we get the product, there are sales and the distribution, and then the product use at the customer's place. And um, it's like the flight, the airplane is in use in flight. So you get the operate in flight data and the in use data of all different kinds of product. Then at the end of the useful life, and then you have the disposal and the recycling uh, business, like the DOE has a remake institute. So at different stages, you can go back to, to the refurbishment, reuse, and the recycling. So if we track the product from cradle to grave, uh, this is this will be called the digital thread. So there are different terms. So far, we get uh, uh, some ideas about different terms and also the examples of different uh, terms related to the digital twin. Now let's look at a specific example about uh, sensor digital twin for statistic uh, process monitoring, because I assume the audience is uh, in the quality and the data analytics area, information systems. So I got to talk a little bit more about uh, quality. And uh, so we have a complex systems and uh, this systems, you put sensors like the human body. If you put sensors in the body, you can connect electrocardiogram signals. So this is a three dimensional electrocardiogram signals. And uh, for machine, and similarly, you can put uh, multiple sensors and then create multi-channel signals. And, and but this channel, this signals needs to be processed. And uh, so can we, the basic idea is, can we put virtual sensors in the data space? For example, those red dot, they're data in the data space to detect the flow because when the sensor is mounted on human body, it's actually flowing 
but it's moving, it's a dynamic. So we want to see how often it comes to this area. What is the divergence among the trajectories? And then each sensor like a monitoring station, like virtual sensor like monitoring station. So you, you can see the flux from one virtual sensor to another sensor in the real sensor arena, the, the signals. And uh, then you can do the multi, uh, you can have the network monitoring and then see, see the, what quantum change we have in the network or composition of flux rank. Then we do the flux rank monitoring. And uh, so previously we have page rank, but now you, if you assume each virtual sensor is a web page, then you will have a flux rank. And then it will help the decision support. So the codes and the technical details and uh, are available in this website. And this is the open source uh, code package uh, related to this paper. So uh, if you're interested, please uh, have a look at these technical details in this paper. So the basic idea, we are the metrics fan, and we are inspired by the uh, Leo in the cyberspace. Uh, so you see in, in the metrics, and uh, you see all these characters are in the cyberspace. And uh, they have extraordinary capabilities. And, uh, yeah, they have extraordinary capabilities, and they can adapt it to the to different uh, uh, like environment and uh, uh, activities. So how can we organize the, uh, the sensors and virtual sensors in the data space? So how to self-organize and uh, make the sensors adapted to the data topology and also the moving signal trajectory. So virtual sensors and uh, is uh, the distance from each sensor to a data point is defined in this way. So we actually assign a competitive function one to the output that belongs to a winning sensor and all you assign as zero. So then the Cajonan update can be used to actually move the sensors in the data space. And we found this is very effective. And as we can see, we have two different uh, initial starting point and uh, we do different uh, iteration um, until it converge. As we can see, the virtual sensor actually self-organize in the data space when the, uh, when the, uh, when the, when the, when the, when the, when the algorithm converges. And so now we can monitor the data dynamics or activity in close to a, a sensor. And this is very similar to the, the, to the page rank. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but uh, it's also different because it's not as simple, like you click on a web page, but, uh, and also there are uh, so many uncertainties in the data space. And, and so the input and the initialization and do this, and then we've got the flux rank. But uh, we, we thought, oh, this is great, right? We got the flux rank, but uh, we, we found that the flux rank data, because it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's a compositional data. So it actually lies in the simplex. And uh, because you, you, you cannot really just monitor the data in the simplex. And so and we had this challenge. And then uh, Alex did a great job to address this challenge with isometric log ratio transformation. And then we uh, transform the data so we can do the statistic monitoring to the, to the sensor signals as we do to those to those uh, product uh, features and our quality measurements. So this is a, a healthcare case study. As we can see, there are comparisons between traditional control charms and uh, the new uh, likely, likelihood based on the flux rank. As, and uh, the trajectory doesn't change much, but the dynamics and the flux actually change. And uh, so from the red to the blue, and then the, the, the new, can, new statistic monitoring actually works better than the, the traditional uh, benchmark methods. And there are extensive experiments included in the paper. And so this is an overview of what we have done in the case study. So let me briefly summarize the first uh, uh, topic. So self-organization plays virtual sensors within the signal space according to the basically the data patterns and the topologic features. So virtual sensor network captures the flux dynamics inside presented within the data and by sensing the states and its affinity. Affinity means laboring areas. So signal dynamics are encapsulated by the flux rank and the distortions and shifts out of control behaviors. So we developed a new flux control chart to enable monitoring of nonlinear and non-stationary signals. Now let's move on to the factory digital twin. So the first one is actually the virtual sensors and how do we embed virtual sensors in the sen real sensor signal space? And uh, that's a, a, a very interesting idea. And, uh, inspired by <laughs> the Matrix movie. And uh, now let's talk about the factory digital team for operations. Now it's more about the operations in the factory. 
So at Penn State, if you get a chance to visit Penn State, and uh, so we have actually have a real factory, physical factory in the building, in the middle of the building, uh, and uh, it's in the Leonard building. We see all the machining stations, robots, and uh, the, the casting, welding, and the different working stations. And uh, then we had a MSC project, and uh, inside of this project, we worked with Siemens. And Siemens said, oh, the factory, you have a physical factory, you know, now, and uh, we are operating in the digital twin uh, era, right? So you see, we had a Siemens plant in Hamburg, Germany, and uh, we all the data and digital twin, they are all like connected and help with decision making. And um, so can we do the same for, uh, to improve the manufacturing education in the Internet of Things or digital twin era for, for engineers and the manufacturing engineers or industrial engineers at Penn State or in general for manufacturing workforce? And then uh, I worked with Hong Kong, and uh, Hong Kong did a great job to, to develop this uh, digital uh, model and then make a connection with what we have in the, in the, in the middle of the building, that is uh, our physical factory. As you can see, the, we have the customers, they can place order in the cloud, and then the orders is sent to the, uh, to the factory. And that inventories, and then the AGV, AGV stands for automated ground vehicles. We're, uh, we'll pick up the raw materials based on the order requirement and then process plans. And then he do the autonomous, uh, like uh, vehicle rolling problems. And then you visit the different stations, but the workstations are different. They have drilling, they have milling, and they have machining and uh, different casting welding stations. And if, if you want to finish a product, you need to visit multiple stations. And then after you finish the production, it will go to the uh, a warehouse and then it will get shipped to the customer. So in our basic idea, this is a, this is an autonomous factory without a, a significant human interventions. And and this digital thing gave us, a, I think, very extraordinary capability to monitor the job process network for every job when it's picked up and which station did it go to, and then at what time it reaches a particular station, how long does it wait. And then when the, does it exceed the process, right? And then become the final product. So the job process network is clearly tracked in the workshop. And uh, so this is a called job process uh, network. And uh, at the same time, we have AGV travel network because, because, because you can track AGV where it is right now and uh, when it, it reaches the next station and whether it needs to go back to pick up another order, how many AGVs are waiting, how many of them are busy, right? And how the number of jobs uh, in the waiting list right now, is it up or down? And the number of new orders and the number of finished jobs, so we can track all the details in the manufacturing shop. And the insights and the actions, we talk a little bit about the insights and the actions. Now, the digital twin and the, this is a physical factory. And uh, so sensor signals and the can from the manufacturing things and the states and the behaviors and job status can be fit into the digital twin. And then the AIs can run in all optimization algorithms or scheduling algorithms or production planning and the control algorithms can operate in the digital arena, digital twin arena, and then get back to the physical factory. So the basic fundamental idea is can we like just like Waymo and for transportation, can we build the Waymo for uh, smart manufacturing and also generate uh, new algorithms and scheduling algorithms just like the Uber and then we feed it back to the physical world, those kind of insights and actions. And uh, when, we, when, we, when we have the digital team available, definitely we need to run a lot of what if scenarios and also the design of computer experiments in the digital, uh, uh, digital world. So in the physical world, there are input, uh, input factors and the responses. Response is the key performance uh, index of the, of the factory. And then you have uh, the, the statistic meta models, and then you have discrepancy uh, surface and the simulation uh, experiments. So you iteratively try to identify the uh, optimal scheduling plan or the control algorithms uh, for, the, for the real world so that you can feed the insights and the actions into the physical world. So I talked a little bit about the job flow, and uh, this is a brief example. And uh, when the, the job is, the, the part is picked up on materials, raw materials are picked up, and they go to different uh, stations, less, uh, less, drill, weld, and the mill, and then go to the warehouse. And the second one is the AGV travel, because AGV, doesn't AGV is not attached to a job. 
I can go to different workstations and can drop a job over there and then go back and I'll go to other station to pick up some other stuff and then go to the next station. So that's why you see this map is a little bit um, more complex than the previous map, but it's a good thing that we have all the data in the digital and the physical world uh, so that it helps us to, to optimize our decisions. So this is an example of the performance optimization and uh, uh, we did the cost analysis and the total cost, HGV setup cost, and backlog cost and IO cost. So we need a balance between those costs. We can find, because you don't want a lot of AGVs, it's like a, um, a Waymo in the street. You don't want a lot of Waymo in the street. At the same time, you don't want, want two less AGVs because be, there will be so many jobs waiting for the AGV to pick up, deliver to the next station. So we wanted the optimal number of AGVs so that we can uh, still maintain our throughput and uh, make sure our cost is done and that we don't have a lot of backlogs. And that we, uh, uh, based on the cost analysis, we'll find the optimal for the job shop that uh, in this scale. <laughs> so, so far we talked about sensor digital twin and the factory, uh, factory digital twin. Now it's a, let's get into a very exciting area called a hard digital twin for smart health. And uh, so in the healthcare, we have so many questions, right? We have medical questions. And uh, and uh, like um, all the healthcare decisions, medical decision making, right? And the pharmaceutical questions, how to design the drugs and uh, how to really uh, have the dose and the treatment of clinical trials, right? And also surgical questions and uh, that different kind of disease and uh, they are in different locations and uh, how to have a better, like optimal surgical plan. So all these kind of questions for, for clinical trials, it's an uh, experiment. Pretty much you have different drugs, have control and treatment group. and uh, but it's very costly and expensive. You design physical experiments on the physical subjects, especially clinical trials, they often cost millions of dollars. And uh, there are three phases at least to get a drug approved. And about doing the, those kind of experiments on computer models is much cheaper. And uh, the statistic analysis, computer simulation, all these uh, mathematical tools that we have in IE or in statistics, in mathematics, we can use to do the computer experiments, right? And then, uh, build the digital team to feed back to the physical world and to make a better uh, healthcare delivery uh, uh, solutions. And the key is we we uh, we should have a very like a tight integration of sensing, modeling, and optimization. Because previously, if you separate sensing from modeling and optimization, and uh, you can still do it, right? But it's more in the offline manner. Uh, you cannot call it a digital twin. And if you have, if you closely integrate them together, then it will become the real digital twin. And uh, it's very important that we integrate the gears, sensor, physics, and optimization. They gear up to build this, this digital twin. So here's a, uh, here's a hard simulation model that we uh, developed. Let me see the electrical wave, uh, propagate, and the conduct uh, in, the, in the heart. And um, you see heart is a 3D object. And when we take the EKG measurement, it's one dimension. It's like uh, you are taking a picture, right, from one angle. And, uh, but it's truly, it's 3D. And uh, we need to monitor the heart from all different angles to the body surface. So if you want to get a complete picture, and this is a simulation model, and uh, this simulation model can, cohort simulation can really help us to do a lot of things on the, in the virtual heart, surgical plans, pharmaceutical designs and uh, medical questions, all kinds of questions. And uh, this, this is a very interesting work with Dr. Bing Yao. Um, and um, so we have, we, we, it's very easy to measure the uh, heart surface potential or the sensors on the body surface. The inverse problem is how do we map it back to the heart as an internal organs? Obviously the electromagnetic physics from the heart to the, to the body surface or from the body surface to the, to the, to the heart. Because if you look at the forward problem, it's uh, heart generated electricity, and then you've got to propagate it to the body, right? Then you can detect it. But once you detect it, and how do you estimate or get back to the heart? So we need a, we need a relationship. It's not uh, a simple linear regression anymore, right? But uh, you, need, you have like X, the heart surface, and then you have surface, and as uh, body surface potential mapping, BSPM is body surface potential mapping. And uh, the data also varies space and time, right? So and the, this R actually incorporates uh, physics and we need to solve this. This is ill conditional problem, ill conditional problem. But uh, luckily we have the physics and uh, the electromagnetic physics. So we need to put the physics into this R matrix. However, there are uncertainties because these are real data. 
and we need to consider the spatial, this is spatial regularity, and the handle approximation error by spatial correlations. Because if you can think, like if two points are very close to each other in the heart, they should have regularity, and uh, they shouldn't have very big uh, deviations. And also from one frame to the next frame, temporal should have regularity, model robustness to measurement noise. And, uh, but this problem is uh, it's not, uh, it like, cannot be really solved or tackled by traditional algorithms. Because this is, uh, so we developed the new algorithm it's called generalized dipole multiplicative optic method. So this is another way, another effort to develop the hard model. And um, yeah, so far uh, I covered the sensor digital twin, factor digital twin, and also the hard model. And, uh, and uh, so for the, I, I think the high level, and so that give you guys a very good picture about uh, the different areas and uh, what are the fundamental problems we are addressing. So this is the, uh, some papers with uh, my former PhD student, uh, uh, Dr. Bing Yao. And uh, so in different places, if you're interested in this work, please uh, uh, shoot me an email or, um, or you can check into the details, technical details in those papers. And at the end, and now I would like to uh, give a little bit of uh, advertisement of the Fulbright uh, program. Because last year I was a Fulbright scholar to Finland, and, which is a very nice place. And uh, as a Fulbright ambassador, I, I, I really want you guys to really consider the Fulbright program. And here's the link if you're interested in the Fulbright program. And uh, then if you go to the Northern uh, Europe and all Finland, you can have a look at the Aurora Borobolis. Uh, in, the, in the sky in, the, in, in winter, and also there's some very nice activities, winter activities uh, in Finland. Um, so if you are in the process to consider a sabbatical and uh, or start this full time program, please uh, feel free to contact me, and I will be happy to supply more information to you. Yeah, so. Um, very nice uh, uh, place and also very nice research program, as you may see the metal 3D printer uh, and the scanner. And uh, I hope from the QCRE and the DAIS, we have more researchers that can build the international collaborations with uh, uh, with uh, Finnish researchers or Finland researchers or in general, the full bite program. Yeah, so in the very end, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, our uh, sponsors, NIH, NSF, and uh, Penn State and uh, industry partners. And without their support, this work will well, not, those, all this work will not be possible. And, uh, and thank you very much to our sponsors. So here is my contact information. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to interact with the community about the digital twin work. And also thank the host, Dr. Chelsea Jing, Dr. Xiao Wei, and Amy too, yeah, and uh, Saeed. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce and uh, my work through this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Thank you for the very informatic presentation. Now let's uh, begin the Q&A session of the presentation. So audience, please feel free to type in the questions in the Q&A options down below in the Zoom interface. Okay, so while we're waiting for the audience questions, Dr. Yang, I have a question with regard to the digital twin. As you have the experiences collaborating with all the industrial leaders in the digital twin, like the Siemens. So from your perspective, what's the major challenges you observe in this digital twin industry? Oh, that's a good question. Major challenge in the in building the digital twin. Digital twin has, has a long story and uh, recently, uh, when I was in uh, in forms, Dr. Asayed has a very good comment about uh, all kinds of uh, buzzwords. He, he actually told us, like, uh, uh, focus on the fundamental science and then, and uh, don't uh, get too obsessed with the buzzword. So here I want to say digital twin. Indeed, it's a it's a buzzword, but uh, there are fundamental science behind the digital twin. And uh, as a researcher, we should focus more on the fundamental science. And uh, this science has been in the IE for a long time. And digital twin now, now it is in the in in in, in its current form. The the main reason is the sensor, the sensing capability that uh, we don't really have. We didn't have many hundreds of years ago or fifty years ago. 
And uh, if you look at the Uber example, why Uber is so successful because it's built, it's built a digital twin and a sharing economy because they have access to the to the digital data, the, uh, the, the, the sensing data in real time so that they can run the online and synchronization and decision making algorithms. Yeah, so and uh, in so sensing capability, I, I see sensing capability is uh, is uh, is our advancement is uh, is a major like a uh, breakthrough. And but that is not enough because if you have sensor signals, it only like bring the data to the cyber world, help you build a model, but you can build a very comprehensive model. And uh, but sensor signals are changing over time, and uh, you can visualize the, the 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 data how they change over time. And the building models, digital models, and uh, it's pretty much is with us with our industry engineering, industry and systems engineers. Um, everything industry and system engineering become a major or become a field. Right, we build a lot of models, and sensing help us build a, a, a push the model to a to a new height, and uh, at the same time we can run our um, uh, IE uh, methods and tools like uh, or algorithms or optimization algorithms or decision making algorithms, and all do the design and analysis of computer experiments, and then we can feed back into the uh, the insights and actions into the physical world, and that's what I really want to emphasize with different kinds of examples. And uh, for some time, if we really focus on the building, the, like uh, like Brad Peter in the in the computer or in the digital world, it will become uh, pure computer graphics. But uh, we focus more on the uh, simulation and the computer experiments and decision making. So I think that's our strength in the ISE community. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the great explanation. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? I have a quick question to ask, actually, to, uh, to Dr. Rowe. Yeah, a, a great presentation. So one of my questions will be, uh, what's the time lag between, let's say, the data generation in a physical system and then its representation in the digital uh, twin system? Because you're utilizing some of the data to build the digital twin itself, right? And my second question will be, like, if you're doing the simulation later on, once you have collected the data from the digital, how fine grain is the simulation? I mean, how realistic you're keeping it or how, let's say, finer we're going it deeper into so that we can explore more options. So these are the, the two questions I have. Oh, Saeed, a uh, really, really good question. And uh, I think uh, you, the, the question you are asking, um, each one of them, uh, they are uh, very good research topics and it can be can be can be written as a book actually with a, a lot of research and in that area I think the first one the time lag and the sensor uh, data synchronization into the digital world and I think that's that's very critical because we in the in in the old or uh, in, in traditional way we have a lot of digital models like uh, they can they can be offline right and then they can train but uh, the decision cannot go back to the physical world in time. And uh, why Uber is so successful because the GPS data are transmitted in real time. And so if, if you think about the time lag, if the, if the time lag is one hour and uh, you have to wait in the airport for an hour to get your Uber, I think a lot of customers are not going to be happy, right? Yes. And, yeah. And uh, the time, timeline is, and is also very critical in the manufacturing and the healthcare. If you think about uh, the heart, and uh, I, I think uh, in, a, in a heart attack or myocardial infarction case, I think time is very, very important and time, timeline is. And uh, so that's a very good uh, question. And uh, it can be um, uh, like a, a hardware question and how to improve the sensors and make it re in real time. But now we have really a lot of good sensors they can transmit uh, in high quality and uh, in high speed. So that's why it's not like we don't have a lot of data. We have a lot of data in real time. Now, how do we build the Build the digital model, right? That's a yes. That's a critical challenge that we are facing right now in the uh, in the community. How to handle the real uh, the real time data? And uh, yeah, that's the first question about the time lag. And what's the uh, second question? The second question was how fine grain you're making the simulations compared to the real world. So. Oh yeah, that's a very good, uh, very good question. And uh, I, I think uh, in our community we have some really outstanding research research works uh, ongoing right now. And in Infant, I see a lot of colleagues, and uh, they are working on fantastic algorithms. And the first first one is the offline online model. How do you do the trade off, and how do you optimize and uh, balance between the offline simulation and the online and uh, those kind of integration? That the specific topics, and uh, I see a lot of research they are working on in Infant. The second question uh, about the fine grain models, and um, 
People often refer this as a high fidelity model and a low fidelity model because high fidelity model, as I did in my uh, simulation or in my case, and the uh, hard case of the cardiovascular system, high fidelity models they run very slowly, but they give you very good results, right? And uh, however, low fidelity model and you do a lot of approximation, right? And they they run very fast, but they may not give you uh, very high accurate results, but they can give you. Uh, some some starting point for decision making, right? And the benchmark uh, 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 point or serve as a data a basis for quick decision making. And then you can continue to run the high fidelity model. And how to balance the low fidelity and high fidelity. I also see a lot of colleagues, they are working in this area. And uh, I think this is a, also a very hot topic. And, uh, and uh, I truly really encourage like uh, uh, all the colleagues and uh, they, they continue to dive into this area and integrate with uh, our discipline, with our applications, and uh, with manufacturing or healthcare applications, and maker, uh, I see a lot of fantastic methodologies, but uh, they got to be like uh, applied into the real world uh, case studies or applications, so that we, i.e., generate a broader impact. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for answering the questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes our question and answer session. Um, in closing of today's webinar, both the PowerPoint and recorded version of the presentation will be made available online on the webinar's archive page, five to seven business days. And um, thank you very much, Dr.